Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 13, titled, Disturbing Conclusions, Part 1. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Island Baptist. This is your first time with us. This is where we study the Bible. So if you got one of those, find your spot in the book of Luke, chapter 13. If you don't have one of those and have a phone, it has even more Bible in it than maybe even written pages. So Luke, chapter 13 where we are working our way through the book of Luke. And we started chapter 13 last time in the first five verses, and we're going to be there uh, again this morning just because the topic is uh, big enough to require us to spend several Sundays together on it. Anybody married here? Your marriage was totally smooth. You've never had a problem. You've 100% gotten along all your lives. Let me see your hand. All right, sir. We know... We, can you blame him, gentlemen? I mean, he has to, you know, he's got it right there. He has to say she was perfect in every way. <laughs> if only. I mean, one of the things I, I say, I get my, when I marry people, I, I make them apologize to each other in the, in, the, in the marriage ceremony. I make them apologize and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Because you're not going to remember the vows I make you say, but you will remember the need to say you're sorry probably this time tomorrow. This will not even carry you through to the end of the day, most likely. Uh, relationships are tough. Marriage can be even tougher. Uh, I read a story this week of a couple who got married in Stockholm, Sweden. They're Swedish, obviously. Stefan and Erica uh, Svanstrom had a very interesting honeymoon. They were going to go on an extended honeymoon, more than a month, and they were going to go to several places, mainly in the southern hemisphere. But in order to fly out of, out of uh, Sweden, they had to fly through uh, Munich, Germany. They arrived in Munich, Germany, got hit with a massive snowstorm. All the airports were shut down. So they were five days held over in Munich, one of the worst snowstorms Europe had ever had, Germany had ever had. So of course, they weren't, they were, you know, they bought the Bermuda shorts. They didn't have anything to wear. Uh, finally got on a plane, got all the way down to Cairns, Australia, which is where they were uh, intended to go, just in time for Australia to have the largest hurricane to date that has ever hit the area. And it went right directly over Cairns. And some of us who were from here know what it's like to get hit by a hurricane. You're no air conditioning, uh, no water, people can't get out, and so they, their next stop was supposed to be Brisbane. Brisbane was about four hours away. It, it had a massive flood. They couldn't go to Brisbane, so they decided that they were going to catch a plane and fly. This all happened within about three weeks. And they were going to fly the other side of Australia to Perth. They, it was, of course, Australia is a big country, and if you know, wet on one side, it's surely going to be dry on the other. Boy, was it. In fact, so much so, they almost perished in a brush fire over there that burned the villa that they were in and everything. So, so they left Australia, and they went to New Zealand. This is a true story. Landed in New Zealand only a day after a 6.3 earthquake uh, wrecked Christ Church, which was the main city there in, in New Zealand. Left New Zealand, flew to Japan. We're in Tokyo, Japan, when, when Tokyo was hit with, to date, the largest earthquake that has ever hit Tokyo. So guess what they did? They just went back to Sweden. <laughs> because, welcome to marriage, right? Because stuff happens. Why do bad things happen? We started looking at that last time, and we're going to be considering that again probably for the next couple of times together. Why do bad things happen? In particular, why do bad things happen to good people? And that's basically the topic and what Jesus is dealing with here in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It's a topic that's brought to him, and so he addresses it, and he addresses some of our erroneous ideas and the way we measure things. And let's consider what he has to say here. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now on the same occasion there were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. It implied there is a question. So these people are honoring God. They're They've traveled from the north part of the country to the southern part of the country. They're there with their sacrifices. It's required in the scriptures that they do this. These are not bad people. These are good people. And yet, for some reason only known to Pilate, he kills them, probably just because he could. The question arises, why do bad things happen to these good people? Jesus answers the question, first of all, with another question. Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners? So the only conclusion is they must have been doing something wrong. Isn't that right? Something happened to someone over there. Was like, oh, well, we don't know what they were doing, but it must have been something bad. God got them, though, didn't he? That's what they're thinking. God got them. 
Now, we don't know what they were doing. They were coming down, they were religious, they're, they're seemingly honored God, but, but behind all the scenes of all the, 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 the clothing of righteousness that they were wearing, there was something evil, and therefore God got them, and we can see that his evidence is what happened to them there. Jesus says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. They assumed themselves better. Well, it didn't happen to us, and it happened to them. We must be better people. That's the way people reason. And so Jesus brings up another topic of similar event, a current event there in Jerusalem. Do you suppose, he says, verse 4, that those 18 on whom the tower slow and fell with in recent days of this conversation, those 18 upon random people walking down the street happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but the tower slow and fell on them. The reasoning of the day is, oh, God got them. Those are bad people. There were 18 evil people, and the rest of us who are alive, of course, were not evil because we didn't get caught in that fall. Do you suppose that those 18 whom the tower Siloam fell and killed them, that they were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? That's who he's talking to here. All these religious men, all these people who think, well, I, we must be better than those guys because look what happened to them. No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Why do bad things happen to good people why why do we think and we tend to think just like they do something bad happens we think oh i wonder what she did something happens to us bad i wonder what i did why do you think that way what makes you think that there is always a direct line between the things that you do and the things that you experience because i'm telling you you didn't get that thinking from the scriptures because that's not what they teach there's not always a direct relationship between the way that you live and the life that you're experiencing. I'm going to give you an example. How many sinners do I have here? i got only one married happy man. <laughs> How many sinners do I have? So the Bible says your sins deserve death. Can you explain to me why you're alive today? Something's wrong with that. So, so, so there is not a, I can say honestly for you, there is not a direct relationship between what you've done and what you're currently experiencing. And I can't promise you it's going to last. But I can tell you today, you're not getting what a sinner deserves, which is death. Not just six feet under, but all the way in hell. So there's not a direct relationship always between what you do and what you experience. And yet we always we seem to think that way. Why do bad things happen? We always assume there's some kind of direct relationship. Again, as I, as I showed the young people, it's got to do with how we measure things. Little boy comes running into in his mom and says, Mom, I'm six feet tall. I said, She said, What are you measuring with? I'm measuring with a ruler. He had one of these. Yeah, he's three years old, four years old. According to this ruler, yeah, you are six feet tall if you think that is 12 inches. But if in fact it's not, then you're off in your measurements. This great illustration of the way you and I operate. We think because we all agree. You say it's a ruler, I say it's a ruler, we all agree it's a ruler, we all vote, we say it's a ruler, we, we get a president that says it's a ruler, we all say it's a ruler. We think that now God, because we have voted, is going to agree with our measurements. He does not. God says this is not a ruler. It's not. Our problem is, is that, yeah, we're all thinking similarly, but we are not thinking like God. Our problem is our system of measurement. Our problem is our thinking. And we think that good things, bad things happen to bad people. You're... you're you're in good company, not only in this room, but also biblically. The disciples come to Jesus with the same line of thinking. Notice their question. So as they went along, Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. Of course, the reasoning of the theology of the day is he must have done something wrong. Or his parents must have done something wrong, and that's the question that they ask. Rabbi, who sinned? See, it's unthinkable for them. That this guy would have bad in his life unless someone did bad to cause it. But notice, there's not a direct relationship between anything that anyone did and what happened to him. Jesus says, neither. Neither he sinned nor his parents sinned. It's for a totally different reason. We think there's a direct relationship. There isn't always. There isn't always. Why do bad things happen to good people? We began talking about this last time, and we came to the conclusion, or we saw the conclusion, the main reason is bad things, hear me carefully, don't happen to good people because there aren't any. See, if you think there's such a thing as good people, automatically you're thinking from this point on it's going to be wrong. I will tell you, if you think there are good people, you didn't get that thinking from the Scriptures, and you didn't get it from Jesus, and you certainly didn't get it from God. 
Because the scriptures are very plain that there are no good people. Bad things don't happen to good people because there aren't any good people. Notice the categorizations here, categorical statements made here by Paul in Romans 3. Therefore, there is none righteous, no, not one. So bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things happen, but they happen to bad people. There are no good people. Again, well, I don't agree with that. Well, let me just tell you, it's not your eternity. It's not your heaven. It's not your earth. It's not your life. So so if we all want to vote and say that this is 12 inches, we can do that, but it doesn't make it 12 inches. We all want to think that there's good people. We can all vote to say there's good people according to our standard of measurement, right? But it doesn't make it true. The Bible says there aren't any good people. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Bad things don't happen to good people because there's not any of those. In fact, there haven't been for a very long time. If you were with us last time, the last time there were good people, they lived in a garden and they weren't wearing any clothes. And bad things didn't happen to them. Adam and Eve had nothing bad to him. In fact, God made a pronouncement over all the creation on the sixth day. Behold, he says, it was very good. The last time the earth was ever like that. Last time human life was ever like that. As soon as they sinned, they began to replicate sinners, just like where, where we came from, which is sinners. And you gave birth to sinners if you have children. And the world is full of sin, and so the world is full of this kind of people. The thing that ought to shock you is though the world is full of this kind of people, that good things still happen. That's the thing that should shock you. Not that bad things happen to good people because there aren't any of those. But that good things happen to bad people ought to blow you away. I can't believe it. Why, why would, would you, if, if you were God, would you be that kind to us when this is all you have to work with? So, so bad things don't happen to good people. Why do bad things happen ought not be the question. Why do good things happen? That should be the question. That should bother us. Bad things happen because we live in a bad world and because we're bad people. Good things happen because God is merciful and gracious to us. That's all. Look at your life right now. Think of the good things that you have. Here's what I want you to say over those things. You don't deserve any of those. You didn't earn them. You don't deserve them. God doesn't owe you those things. Those are in your life because God is being merciful to you and gracious to you. God is being merciful and gracious to those who are in church, praise God. God is being merciful and gracious to those who are not in church, praise God. Again, leading them, hopefully, to repentance. Not wishing that any should uh, perish, but all should come to repentance, the Scripture teaches us. So, so we began last time looking at the first disturbing conclusion, that namely being that life isn't fair. You've heard that before, right? But it isn't fair on a cosmic spiritual level. God is not being fair to us. He is not. Because what's fair for people like this? I'll show you. This is fair. The wages of sin is death. And yet here you all are, including me, sinners, still breathing. Because why? God's not being fair to you, sir, ma'am. And you don't want him to be. The line that says God is fair, don't get in it. I'm going to get fairness from God. Don't get in that line for crying out loud. You don't want God to be fair with you because fair is death. And that, of course, not just talking about six feet under. It's talking about all the way in hell. So not only are you not six feet under, you are also not in hell. God is not being fair to you. You don't want him to be. This is not a level playing field. This is a playing field, and the, the rules are based upon mercy and grace. They're not, listen, on legalistic things, because if they were, you and I would be in hell. God is not being fair. You don't want him to be fair. How can we think of it? How can we complain about getting the better side of unfairness? So the game isn't fair, but we still won. Are you going to complain about that? Of course not. See, by the mercy and grace of God, you're winning because of what he's done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. He's he's not being fair to us. He doesn't want to be fair to you. He wants you to get. Was it fair, Lois? By the gift of God is eternal. By the gift of God's eternal life through Christ Jesus, was God fair to His Son? Was it fair? 
For him to hang on the cross and die for your sins, that is not fair. Suffer separation from his father because of us? Would you do that? Would you let your son do that for the likes of... That's not fair. He's not being fair to you because in, in the way he did, accomplished that by, was by not being fair to his son. So God is not being fair to us. First disturbing conclusion of this story and of this line of thinking that we're pursuing together. The second disturbing conclusion is this. God, and we already talked about it, but God doesn't owe us anything good. That's the second disturbing conclusion. God doesn't owe anybody anything. People get mad at God all the time because they feel like God owes them something. And like I said, I don't know where they got that from. It wasn't from the scriptures. Again, if our line of measurement is incorrect, we're always going to come up with a false conclusion, and that's where we are. God doesn't owe anybody anything. Let's say, for instance, it's probably not going to be hard for you to imagine because you can just jet out of here as soon as we're done and go over there and try it out. But over here, 400 yards from us, is the beach. As soon as church is over, you go to Waterburger, get you something to eat, and you go out there and you build you a sand castle. Nice little sand castle with little doors and windows and all kinds of stuff. And out of the seed weed and the driftwood, you build these little stick people. And you sit there. Now, now that you've built yourself, your, now that you have your creation and your little stick people, do you now owe them anything? Are you responsible now to take care of them? Is a police officer going to come up and say, you better not let that fall down? Or is it not true that you can just stand there because it's your creation and just fold your arms and wash it, wash away? Because you don't, and you don't owe those stick figures any explanation, do you? Is it also true, or is it immoral? Would it be immoral for you just to... Would that be wrong? I can't believe he did that. He killed those stick figures. You made them. You can wipe them out right now. If I come over there and mess up your sandcastle, that would be sort of immoral. But the fact that you're messing up your own sandcastle, that's your business. That's your business. God doesn't owe us anything because he created us, ladies and gentlemen. Not only does he not owe us anything, he doesn't, important, doesn't owe us an explanation either, the stuff that he does. He explains himself a lot, got the scriptures. You, you talk to him in prayer, he wants to answer, he loves to do that. But understand, he doesn't owe that to you. He's not beholding to anybody for anything. In fact, if, if you want to argue the whole God owes me stuff, that's the only thing you can say God owes you. He owes you a wage for the sin that you've committed. But, of course, he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to be fair to you. He doesn't want to give you what you actually deserve. He is beholden to you, but it's only on that level. As, as creations of God, God doesn't owe us anything. As creations of God who've also sinned against his cosmic order, he definitely doesn't owe us anything, especially nothing good. Second disturbing conclusion. God doesn't owe us anything, which leads us to our third disturbing conclusion. God's reputation, this is a hard one to swallow maybe, but listen to it. God's reputation is damaged every time you and I are not judged for our sins. When was the last time you sinned? Don't tell me. Let's just say it was today. Is that a safe assumption? So, but you're not in hell, and you're not six feet under. There's a level at which that damages the reputation of God for having not carried through with what he promised should happen to sinners. He's hanging his reputation out to dry so that you may have a chance to repent and turn to him. Hanging his reputation on the likes of you and me. Would you do that? I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I'm glad you're not God, and you're glad that I'm not God, but I'm glad that he is. He's being kind and gracious to us. Notice, just again, Scripture teaches us this. This was, that is, the sacrifice of Jesus, was to demonstrate his righteousness because God, in his merciful restraint, he let his, the sins previously committed go unpunished for the demonstration. He allowed his reputation. So the Satan's sitting next to God saying, why aren't you killing these sinners? God's saying, I'm waiting. I'm holding out. But it makes you look bad, God. Yes, it does. But I love them. And I want something for them that they, their deeds can't earn. And so he sent his son Jesus to die in our place to, among other things, fix his reputation. So notice, the sins previously committed, he just glossed over them. That is, if the, 
the, of, the, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus to show, listen, yes, I passed up these sins but because Jesus was going to die and pay for them. People in the Old Testament were, were looking forward to the death of Jesus just in the same way as we today, 2,000 years later, look back to the death of Jesus, both times in faith, both times. Again, to justify himself, God sends his son, Jesus, to show why he's passing over our sins. It impugns the reputation of God every time a sinner is not judged. Happens today millions of times every day. Fourth disturbing conclusion. And this goes in part and parcel of what we already said, but we need to say it out by itself. God's got a right to do whatever he wants. That may not disturb you. You may say, of course he does. But have you ever thought through it? Whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, and he doesn't owe you an explanation for whatever he does. God's got a right. This is his place. It's not your place. Is that okay, by the way? Because I've got to get back to him about it and make sure he's okay to do whatever he wants to in your life. He doesn't need your permission, does he? To do whatever he wants? He's got a right because he's God to do whatever he wants. Be sure not to take his loving kindness towards you and, and his grace towards you for granted because here's what I know. Here's what you need to know. If he were not loving and kind and gracious, there wouldn't be a thing you could do about it because he does whatever he wants. He doesn't owe you anything. The fact that you have good in your life and that he's being kind to you is a decision that he has made about himself and who he's going to be, but you have absolutely no influence over that whatsoever. So be very grateful that God is who he is. Very grateful that he is love, that he's the epitome of love and kindness, and we should be so thankful for, about that, but we absolutely couldn't do anything about it either way. We could not. One of the common phrases you hear today is, this is my life. This is my life. This is my body. I have a question I have for that is, so if it is, then why don't you get to keep it? Because no one does. No matter what we do, no matter what kind of exercise program and eating program and, I don't know, ha happy thoughts and prayers, we, none of us live. We all, we all get out of here by dying. So if it was your life, it would seem, at least logically, that you would get to keep it, but you don't. So my conclusion is it must not be yours. In fact, it's not. Life is given by God. He didn't have to give it. He doesn't have to to let us keep it for any set amount of time. What, what he takes from you is something that he gave to you anyway, and he doesn't owe you an explanation when he does take it back for you. And you may say, as people say, what gives him the right to do that? And that's just it. Nothing does. He answers to nothing, to no one. God's got a right to do whatever he wants, which leads to our fifth disturbing conclusion. Good deeds, your good deeds and mine, don't earn good deeds in return. We, th we think of the world and spiritual existence as some kind of exchange process. I do good, so God gives me good back. And so that's why I have to do good, because if I ever mess up and do bad, then something will happen to me. And, and so we reason from the opposite direction. When something bad happens to me, I immediately think, what did I do? We think there's some, always a direct relationship between the things that we do and the things that happen to us. And I've already demonstrated to you that's not true. Because here you are a sinner, not in hell. There's not a direct relationship always between what we do and what we experience. Our good deeds don't earn good from God in return. Again, you may strongly disagree with that, and you've got a right to do that. Maybe you think, I've been really good, God. Or maybe compared to others, God, I've been really good. And, and I hope that's true, by the way. Oh, I hope you have. But you understand, what makes you think God owes you good in return for what you've done? You, you haven't gotten that thinking from the Scriptures. Do, do your good deeds negate the bad ones that you did? Can you explain to me how that works? So, so you've been bad, but now you're good. And that's going to cancel out the bad stuff that you did? Where, where are you getting that thinking from? 
Let me, let me help you think just on, on, a, on a logical basis here in the world that we live in. So I've got a murderer over here in Cameron County. Killed a guy, cold blood. Fictional story, but imagine it. Kills a guy, put on trial, found guilty, goes to jail for the rest of his life, of course. But he is very sorrowful for what he did. He, he's, he's brokenhearted. He, he even becomes, and, and praise God, he becomes a Christian, trusts Christ as Savior. He, he turns his life around. He witnesses to all of his inmates. He serves God for the rest of his life. Has he ceased to be a murderer? Has he ceased? He's turned his life around. What are you telling me? He's turned to Christ. He's no longer a murderer, right? Wrong. Unless somehow one of these good deeds that he does resurrects the person that he killed. And then he's not a murderer anymore. But you see, murder, murder is a, a, a lifetime offense because you took someone's life. He will forever be a murderer until the day that he dies. Likewise, sin is a lifetime, actually not a lifetime. It, just like murder has no statute of limitations, neither does sin. In fact, the statute of limitations lasts forever on sin. Because there are eternal laws that you broke and that I broke. And so when we broke them, we committed an eternal crime. So the only way we can pay for that is in an eternal place called hell. Make sense? It's very logical. But we want to think there's something different. So I, even though I've committed an eternal crime, something that I do in time is going to make up for the eternal crime that I committed. No. You're not going to undo one bad thing that you did by any good thing that you do. That is simple. You didn't get that thinking from the Scriptures. Being good in time does not in any way fix our eternity, does it? Does it make any sense? Again, we find ourselves thinking, I'm making up for the bad things I did as a kid by being good today as an adult. No, you're definitely not. Because they can't be undone. See, you don't, if that's the way you think, you don't understand how sin works. You cannot make up for a single sin, not a single law that was broken. E even if you stack up an enormous amount of good deeds, it can't undo the bad deeds that you did. We're talking about an eternal crime here. So what eternal are you going to do that's going to fix all that? It doesn't make any sense. Not even, listen, this is critical. Not even God fixes the laws that you break. Because they can't be fixed. So God doesn't fix laws, but somehow you think you're going to fix the laws by the good deeds that you're doing. I don't know where you got that thinking from. So God can't fix these laws, but you think you can? God doesn't fix the laws that we break. He pays for them. So what was happening on the cross, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, that was God paying for the laws that you've broken because they can't be fixed. If they could be fixed, then Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, Father, if there be some other way, let this cup pass from me. He didn't let it pass because there was not another way. These laws can't be fixed. Once broken, they can only be paid for, and that's exactly what Jesus came to do. And so it, that's what eternity, what, what is life about? The young people here, they're headed to camp this, this week. You're going to learn a lot more about the kind of stuff that I'm teaching. What, what is life about? What's the answers? What's the questions? What's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to decide who's going to pay for your sins. Who's going to pay for them? Because you can't fix them. You can't undo them. Broken laws can't be fixed. God, not even God fixes them. You've got to decide who's going to pay for them. Either you get to pay for them in a place called hell, which is going to be forever, eternal laws, right? You've broken them, you're an eternal criminal, which requires an eternal punishment in a place called hell, or the eternal one, Jesus, can pay for those sins. Option one, option two. Option two is the choice of God, obviously. How great is his love for us how unfair was he to us by not giving us what our sins deserve and placing that sin upon his son in the most unfair demonstration there ever has been or ever will be on the planet earth. So that you and I, by placing our faith in what Jesus did, can have our sins paid for by him instead of paying for them by themselves. I call that a heck of a deal. That's what it is. That is a heck of a deal. We can never, though, back to our disturbing conclusion our good deeds don't earn any good from god we can never merit the favor of god because we're sinners forgiven sinners yes still sinners all of our favor comes from christ all of our merit is in him all of our good is in jesus so how can i think that any good that i do can undo anything bad that i've done it is a fallacious way to think we don't deserve good in return for the good things that we do but except 
We experience good all the time. I told the previous service, you want to ask about my personal life? I got bad stuff. Let's put it in a pile right here. Stuff that I wish I could change, stuff that I regret. Stuff, stuff that I wish was different in my life. But I want to tell you, that pile compared to the pile of the good stuff in my life, there is no comparison. I'm a sinner just like you. I'm a, I'm a lawbreaker. I, I'm a person for whom Christ, God had to hang his son on a cross for me to have a chance to go to heaven. That's who I am. I, I'm the list there in Romans chapter 3. Not one righteous. I'm among them. Not one who understands. Not one who seeks for God. I'm among them. God came seeking for me, right? When we say we're lost. You don't find Jesus. Jesus finds you. He finds you. He found me. Even with all that against me, the pile of bad in my life is actually super small. Because why? God has been gracious to me. Merciful to me. Kind to me. The thing that draws me every day to do what he's called me to do is because of this kindness and mercy. I, have, I owe him so much and I'm not paying him back. I know that I'm not. But, but at least considering what he's done for me, I, I have to live by saying, God, thank you so much for being so kind to me and, and, and taking myself far away from God. You owe me this and I deserve that. By God's grace, I've learned to stop doing that because that's not good thinking. You're measuring it, yep, but you're measuring it wrong. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about what God has said to us this morning. How, how are your measurements today? Are you measuring it right? So even if we all agree about the measurements and all agree about how things are supposed to be, if they disagree with what God says, well then, we thought wrong. Maybe today, maybe today you realize the great need you have to be forgiven for your sins. You don't want to step out of this life and into the next one and pay for your own sins. God doesn't want that for you. He knows how horrible that is going to be. How horrible is it? It was horrible enough for him to hang his son on a cross to die and pay for you to keep that from happening to you. That's how horrible it's going to be. He knows what it's like. He knows where you're headed. And so it remains for you to turn to him right now in repentance, turning away from whatever you thought was going to get you to heaven and turning to Christ. Instead of paying for your own sins, allowing Christ to pay for your sins. Turn to him right now and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I, I want you to forgive my sins. I trust you to do what you did on the cross and apply it to my life. You have to make that decision. There has to be a personal encounter in which you come to Christ. God, I thank you that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I thank you, Lord, that there's not a prerequisite. It's not like uh, there's no sinners here. You didn't come to die for the righteous because there aren't any of those. You didn't come to die for the good because there aren't any of those. You came and demonstrated your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for the way and the hope and the chance that we have of heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.